Peter Barton-Smith, consultant gynaecologist, and I'm director at the Endometriosis Clinic in London, based at the Princess Grace Hospital. So robotic surgery has been going for 20 odd years, and the initial trend was very much urological. It all really found its foothold in prostatectomy for prostate cancer. 2005, it's got FDA approval for gynaecology. And so gynaecology, the story of gynaecology begins at that point. Um, and it was really gynaecology was the second specialty to come on board in robotics. But we're talking about one particular robotic surgery system here. We're talking about the Da Vinci surgical robot. There are other robots for orthopedic surgery and neurosurgery, I believe. Uh, but for ab ab abdominal surgery, uh, the Da Vinci robot's been the main one, and it was really mostly uh, abdominal surgery that it was initially started on. So then around that time, there were other specialties getting involved, uh, ENT, for example, ear, nose and throat surgery, uh, cardiothoracic surgery to a lesser extent, more thoracic than cardiac surgery. Uh, general surgery and colorectal surgery, which sort of divides into colorectal or upper gastrointestinal surgery, are really late comers to the party. Uh, and that's probably the main specialties, I suspect. But it's um, having really got quite a high saturation in the US in, prost in urological surgery and gynecological surgery it's really those other newer specialties like upper GI and colorectal which has been more of the focus in recent years as far as I can tell so the initial uh, rollout in gynecology was very much around hysterectomy um, because that was the major focus of unnecessary open surgery. So the whole point of this was that conventional keyhole surgery, otherwise known as straight stick surgery, is not so easy to learn. And the um, increase in the percentage of hysterectomies done by conventional keyhole surgery was slow. Interesting. The point of the robot was to provide a tool that was easier to learn um, and therefore the percentage of hysterectomies done by minimally invasive means would substantially increase as so many women were receiving unnecessary open surgery. And the effects of that are longer hospital stay, not good for hospitals. Uh, slower recovery for the patient, longer time for their relatives to look after them, and obviously slower return to the workplace, which is a general loss to the economy as a as a whole. So hysterectomy is where it started. Uh, there were a few other things in gynaecology around that time that were uh, of interest, which were uh, pelvic floor surgery for prolapse, uh, myomectomy, i.e. the excision of uterine fibroids, uh, and uh, they were really the main things at that point. A little bit later, uh, we began to use it for more complex procedures like endometriosis, and that's where my own use of it has has uh, come 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 in at, at that point. One doesn't want to make it sound like it's. Uh, a massive dumbing down process that means that anyone can kind of do it. You still have to have very secure, safe surgical skills. Uh, you can't just put anybody on it to to do it, you know, because that clearly wouldn't be safe. There, there was a bit of a backlash over robotic complications in, in the States that came up as a result of that. So people only doing a couple of hysterectomies per year and using the robot to do it were always potentially going to run into trouble, not because of the technology, but because of the because of the surgeon. Right. 
Uh, however, the robot bore the brunt of that um, with a lot of sort of Wall Street Journal headlines saying uh, the robot destroyed my life, etc. kind of things, which um, is not really true. Technology is a, is, is, is a tool and is only as good as the person who's operating the tool, really. It's an enhancement, so it gives you greater precision, uh, precision better view. Uh, and it's those things uh, and improved ergonomics from the surgeon's point of view. So that allows you to uh, perform more complex surgery more easily. So the more complex the surgery, the better the use of the technology in a sense, but it's also an enabling tool for a good solid surgeon to be able then to allow um, minimally invasive procedures in less complex cases. Uh, there was some fairly good evidence that compared with conventional minimally invasive surgery, it shortens hospital stay time in a lot of studies. Uh, so freeing up beds more quickly, yes. Potentially less complications in more complex cases, which means that the readmission rates should be less as well, if you're not readmitting patients and then having to look after them, then you, you've not wasted beds that you could be used for other stuff going forward. But to, for that to cover all of your surgery within a, within a hospital, you need quite a few robots, not one robot with, you know, six or 10 surgeons working on it. it, it, it you've got to scale everything up to start to get that sort of advantage. But it seems clear that the waiting times for patients without urgent issues has seriously gone up. So in my own area of end endometriosis, where it's regarded potentially as a little bit of a Cinderella specialty anyway, um, those waiting times have gone from months into years for some people. And so uh, the flow of patients coming into pri private uh, hospitals who can't wait that time or to make a decision themselves uh, has significantly increased. The major criticisms of ro robotic technology is that uh, the perception that it takes longer to perform the surgery. And that all really boils down to the setting up time. So that there's a little bit of extra work to be done to drive a robot into the side of the bed to attach the arms etc etc and when you do your first case ever that could easily take an hour but when you're uh, suitably um, experienced uh, and you've got a good team around you that are suitably qualified then it takes minutes uh, and then the actual procedure itself becomes faster because you can work more quickly because of the precision and the view and accuracy that you have. So it ends up uh, either balancing out or potentially being a bit faster. But a lot of the early papers were critical of it due to the time, but that's because it was in the learning curve. Well, I think Intuitive has been generally pretty good about training uh, from the point of view of the Da Vinci surgical robot. I think they have been pretty hands-on and they've sort of taken over and set standards where individual uh, countries or institutions have not got to that point. They have a fellowship program which funds fellows and that kind of thing. Uh, so to uh, some extent, but that I don't think the curve has reached the point where that's the main focus yet. So there's been a transition in that in the last few years where um, professional bodies within different countries or specialties have begun to take that 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 over and in that comes um, the institution of integrating it into the training of junior doctors not just um, the people who are going to use it now but at the moment uh, it would take such a massive re resource because there's still a lot of people to be trained to use it now without having to um, get too engulfed by dealing with everyone else who may come later. I mean, we, we've already had a technical advance in the couple, last couple of years of trying to go into s single port surgery 
for more complex cases, but that's not currently um, approved for gynecological surgery. That went down the urological route first, and I think possibly the ENT route as well. But certainly in my area where we're operating on young women who may have some issues around their cos the cosmetic appearance of surgery, then uh, there's a potential advantage in that. Yeah. But the, the potential equipment is there, it's just that we can't use it for what we do yet. AI is coming to some uh, training okay. to extent in that there are AI programs with virtual operating theatres and things like that, which can be very useful for um, uh, training. I'm not entirely sure how close we are to automatous robotic surgery. It's a little bit worrying. That's a scary leap. Yeah, well, these, 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 the structures inside a human body are not just this uh, color coded, you know, black and white thing of where things are, and it's easy to pick them out. Often there's a lot of careful di dissection to the locate things, and sometimes that's not entirely objective either. There's a subjectivity to it that's based on experience and skill. So I, I think that's a long way off. I mean, the answer to that question is really that what it really would need to do is to be rolled out on a much bigger scale. Okay. And then you come back to the question of cost. And therefore you come to the question of can other people produce other systems which are less expensive that provide the same experience? And it, to my mind, personally, there are several other robots already on the block being marketed and sold, but they don't match to me the quality of what we started with there's not a cheaper but same option I, that's exactly right and and yeah. th therefore it, it, no one's come up with something that is going to roll out big big scale that's the problem